very much for the for the invitation. I would like to thank Philippe Pochet and the HP, uh, which is an organization that I respect a lot. So I'm very happy to be here. I'm also very honored to share the stage with um, um, such a high representative of the IPCC, which is another organization that I respect a lot. I'm already starting on the social ecology. Um, uh, synergy. So uh, my, my um, perspective here is to tell you a bit about what I call social ecology, which is an approach I've been working on uh, for the last uh, five years and that tries to connect uh, the question of the transition and the sustainability issues with uh, social issues. So the, and and it, it's going to touch on some points that have been already made, but um, I, will, I will carry on those, those points. So first I will tell you about the social ecological approach and what it means exactly to connect, um, let's say, ecological uh, challenges with social issues. Uh, and, and I will go um, uh, about this in, in, in two uh, ways. One is to show how inequality matters in unsustainability. So the point is to connect the inequality crisis with the ecological crisis, and you can do that by first arguing that inequality matters a great deal in our uns unsustainability. And then you can do the reverse argument, which is to show how ecological crises are going to aggravate social inequality and how um, this is going to become a huge challenge as we move forward, and it's already a challenge. And then I will conclude on the simple argument uh, uh, about what um, trade unions, especially EU trade unions, can do about this and how they can actually address this, uh, this problem. So first, um, a bit about the social ecology. So my work builds on the work by Murray Bookchin, uh, uh, Linus Drom, Jim Boyce, among many others. And the, the basic argument is to show that environment challenges are really uh, a social problems that arise largely because of income and power um, inequality and that can find their true resolution by putting forward justice principle and building good institutions. So, it is rather an optimistic argument. It means that uh, ecological problems are not foreign affairs problems. They are pretty much uh, problems that are uh, uh, built by human societies, and so they can be corrected if we correct the drivers of those problems, and those drivers are largely uh, social and political drivers. Uh, so I have two lines of works in the last, in the last five years. The, the first was to first build the social ecological framework, and I did that in a number of uh, um, articles and a, a book in 2011, which is called Social Ecology. And my, my new book is about how to go forward and try to build what I call the social ecological state. That is, the kind of institutions we need to address uh, this, uh, uh, um, to, 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 let's say, to, uh, uh, um, uh, to be the, the institution of the social ecological approach, let's say, let's say that. Um, so, two insights from the social ecological approach. Uh, the first insight is a provocation that I uh, kindly uh, put uh, uh, to my uh, hard science colleagues, uh, which is that I think that it is it, it, social sciences and humanities hold the key to the problems that have been highlighted by hard science. In other words, there is no resolution of our ecological crisis without a combination of hard science, social science, because we need hard science to understand the problem and to understand the severity of the problem, and we need social science to actually solve it. So you need a climate scientist, you need a physicist to tell you that climate change is happening, but you will need an economist, a sociologist, and a political scientist to do something about it. So we need much more cooperation on this question that uh, we have seen uh, over uh, the last three decades where we, ha we had huge progress but the hard, hard science, but not that much progress from the social science, I think, in solving those crises. So the insight is that we, we, we must invest in what I call social ecological knowledge, that is learning how to reform our social systems that are actually framing uh, human behaviors, so uh, um, behaviors and attitudes, so not only responses to price signal, for example, but also systems of values. Because in the end, it's the, the greatest driver of environmental crisis and the great solution to those environmental crises. So we need to learn how to reform those systems in order to preserve our uh, natural uh, uh, life support system. And if we don't do that, uh, 
then uh, environmental science is just going to become a science of uh, disaster contemplation. And, and, and clearly, this is not what we want. And this, there's something really depressing when you are just uh, looking at the journal articles uh, week after week, because now it's on a weekly basis that we have new science, and you don't have the matching solution. So in a way, you spread anxiety and you spread depression, but you don't spread a lot of, 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 of uh, thinking about how to solve those things. So I would love you know, to have a journal where you have a problem and write after that, you have the solution to the problem, but we mostly have problems that are just piling up in those uh, journals. And that's, of course, extremely dangerous for uh, the environmental concern because we are spreading anxiety among citizens and we don't have a lot of solutions. Uh, and so citizens come to hate environmental scientists because they are just the bearer of the bad news. Uh, and that's, of course, a, 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 a great danger because it, it means that in the end, environmental scientists are not being heard by the population. Um, and the second uh, empirical insight, and that is going to be the focus of my presentation today, is that there is a strong empirical link uh, uh, between social issues and uh, environmental crisis. And I'm going to, once again, address this link in the reciprocal, reciprocal uh, way. So uh, we need institutions to actually carry on the social ecological transition. It's not going to be an ecological transition. It's going to be a social ecological transition. It's not, and if it's not social ecological, then it would not be at all. Uh, so it's, it's not going to be something that it's imposed upon people from just a science perspective. It's not, it's not going to work. It's not working today and will not work in the next decade. So we need to connect those issues together if we want to move forward. So one way to, to, to think about the, 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 the role of social ecology and sustainable uh, development theory as we know it since the Brunton Report is to show that the, the great paradox of the Brunton Report is that the heart of the report was about connecting actually the environmental dimension and the social dimension. And it has been almost forgotten in the last 25 years and we have made progress in connecting the economic issues and the social issues, and now everyone knows about the inequality crisis uh, and the work of Thomas Piketty and many others in highlighting this crisis, we also made progress since Copenhagen in connecting the economic aspect and the environmental aspect uh, through the green economy agenda. But we have not made a lot of progress in connecting the environmental question and the social question, and yet that was the key insight of the Brunton Report. The key insight, if you reread the report today, you will see that the, the key message was that the inequality crisis, the inequality was at the heart of the question of sustainability. And that that was a major driver of unsustainability. And so I think this is, the mes this, is this message that we have to uh, rediscover um, uh, today. So uh, a, a few words, um, more words on the context. I think we are living in a, a situation of the paradox of environmental emergency. And what I mean by that is that environmental degradation uh, are, are, are becoming more and more costly and they are com becoming more and more visible and tangible. It's not true to say that because CO2 is invisible, we don't see the effect of climate change. I mean, if you look at the French news, by the way, I'm, I'm French. Uh, if you look at the French news, uh, almost every night we have reports about uh, uh, floods, uh, about, uh, the, I mean, the, the climate is, is becoming, it's more than just weather. I mean, you have s climate news. It's not, you know, you, you have, you have the, the weather flash, but before that, you have 10 minutes of climate news. So you have both. You have the weather and the climate in the in evening news. So uh, people see uh, that this is really happening. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think that it's invisible for them. But yet it's true that especially since 2009, it has become uh, uh, gradually impossible to think, to, to talk about that with policymakers because they will always tell you that social issues come first and this is just, just not the priority of the moment, et cetera, et cetera. So why is that? There is a fundamental reason, which is that, in my opinion, the environmentalist movement has not managed uh, in the last four or five decades to connect social issues with environmental issues. I think that there was a structural gap in 
uh, 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 the, the environmental movement itself. But of course, on top of that came the Great Recession. Uh, and so, of course, it derailed completely uh, the Copenhagen summit. And so the big question today is, now that we are living in a sort of stagnation, soft stagnation, what effect is this, is, is this going to have on the Paris summit? Uh, Copenhagen was certainly the crisis moment. Now we, are, uh, uh, we have passed this moment. But the Great Recession has shortened a collective horizons. And it's much more difficult. And so it's much more easy for people to pit the social against the, envir the environmental in, in this context. So we need to connect the inequality crisis, which is the reality of many societies today, and not just in the developed world, but also in the developing world. We have an increase of domestic inequality in the last 30 years in many, many emerging countries and in many, many developing countries as well as developed countries, and we have the data to prove that. So we need to connect the inequality crisis to ecological crisis. The way I do this is through two different aspects that I'm going to detail briefly. The first approach is what I call integrative social ecology. What I mean by that is that inequality that is triggered by the gap between the rich and the poor and the disappearance of the middle class, etc., etc., is a problem for everyone. So the fact that inequality, domestic inequality, is growing in a number of countries is a problem for everyone. This is where we actually all come together because, because of this inequality phenomenon, we all pay the price uh, in terms of ecological crisis. But yet, there is a differential social ecology approach, which is to show that this collective price is not shared equally among the members of society. And so this, the, the ecological crisis, are of course going to affect the most vulnerable citizens much more than those who are more resilient. And so this is where we have a differential impact. So on the one hand, we are all in the same boat in that the inequality crisis is triggering ecological crisis for which we are all going to pay a price, but this price is going to be very different from uh, a, a, when we consider different members of the society. So let me tell you a bit about integrative social ecology. How can we make the argument that inequality pollutes the planet? In, in other words, how can we make the argument that the inequality crisis is a big driver of environmental crisis. I think you can make this argument at the microecological uh, level that's been alluded to. When you look, you look at the theory of uh, Veblen uh, for the rich, and so you, you, you say that there is a sort of cultural epidemic uh, in the reproduction of the lifestyles of the richest, uh, and so that uh, upper middle class is, going, is, is wanting to uh, emulate the very rich, and so that everyone is going to have an unsustainable lifestyle. That's one aspect, but it's microecological in the sense that it's not a dynamic consideration of the rich and the poor together. It's just the rich, or the rich and the very rich, and you say that there you have a driver of uh, unsustainable lifestyle. You can do the same thing for the poor, and uh, remember what Indira Gandhi said at the Stockholm conference, which is that poverty is actually a huge polluter, and what she meant by that was the fact that uh, the poor degrade natural capital because it's the only form of capital they have access to. And there is a huge literature on biodiversity destruction driven by poverty. But once again, this is microecological in the sense that you don't connect the poor and the rich. So for that, you need a macroecological approach, a macroecological, uh, um, um, uh, yes, approach. And, and I think you have five channels through which you see the connection between inequality and unsustainability. First, that has been said already, inequality increases the need for environmentally harmful and socially unnecessary economic growth. And you can prove using the Piketty Science data on the US that you can reduce both inequality and CO2 emissions uh, in the US, given the very high level of inequality in the US today. So there is a, a very important part of the growth that is not shared, that is captured by the richest. And so that part, you could reduce it and reduce the CO2 emissions that come with it, and you would still have also a correction in inequality. Um, then inequality increases the ecological responsibility uh, of the richest. That's true between countries. That's true within uh, countries. So you can, you can show that 
the, the, the more important the gap is between the rich and the poor, and uh, the, the, the easiest it will be for the rich to transfer the consequence, the harmful consequence of their behavior on the poor. And so they will be actually uh, 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 driven to uh, pollute even more if they don't pay the price uh, of their action, and if there is a huge gap between the rich and the poor. The third uh, channel is the fact that inequality will diminish uh, social ecological resilience of groups and individuals. And you have a pretty substantial literature showing that inequality, for example, uh, so if you take Wilkinson, Pickett, or Paul Farmer, uh, showing that inequality is, is a problem for health. And so because it's a problem for health, it's going to uh, uh, aggravate the impact of ecological crisis. Uh, the fourth channel is the fact that inequality will destroy the capacity to build a collective action that is uh, conducive to uh, uh, transition and sustainability. And I will show you just an example with U.S. inequality and how U.S. inequality is driving political polarization and how political polarization is uh, 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 just uh, 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 preventing environmental policy from happening in the U.S. And if you think about the fact that because of this political polarization of the US, which has everything to do with the increase of income inequality, we will not going to have, we are not going to have a legally binding agreement next year uh, in Paris because the US cannot uh, 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 guarantee uh, the two third majority in the Senate uh, it means that the inequality crisis in the U.S. has a global repercussion. It has a global impact on what we can achieve uh, uh, at the international level. Um, uh, and the fifth uh, and last channel is the fact that when you have more inequality, it's more difficult to offset uh, the uh, uh, potentially socially regressive impact, for example, of a carbon tax. And so it's going to be much more difficult to make it politically acceptable for people. Uh, and that also has to do with the level of inequality. So just to show you one illustration of my point about political polarization, uh, you can absolutely make uh, a parallel between uh, income inequality increase and increase in polarization, political polarization, and you can show that environmental policy in the US was at its peak in terms of uh, uh, the, just, just the amount of legislation that was passed during the Nixon administration, believe it or not, he was a Republican, and you would say that to Republicans today, they will just kill themselves, but that's true. Uh, and uh, that was the golden decade for uh, environmental policy in the US, and that was the level where uh, income inequality was quite low. And so you had bipartisanship, you, have bi you had bipartisanship agreement, and now it's impossible because of political polarization. And income inequality has a lot to do with that. That's just one illustration, but think about the fact that ha this has an impact on what Barack Obama can and cannot do uh, next year in Paris. So we are all living the consequence of uh, income inequality increase in the US, uh, actually. Um, okay, so now to the, the other side of the social ecological nexus, which is uh, differential social ecology. Uh, it's very clear that we have a, a, a new generation of inequality, which is environmental inequality. Inequality in terms of exposure, inequality in terms of access, inequality in terms of uh, many aspects uh, in our societies. And so we have to make them much more visible than they are. For example, inequality in exposure to particulate matters in European cities. Uh, there's been a report by the EEA that was just published on the amount of pollution of uh, European cities, which is really a disgrace. And in France, we are way above all the WHO uh, limits, uh, and, and in Paris is just... Uh, uh, I'm not saying it's going to be Beijing, and so we will have to cut all circulation for next year's summit when uh, the IPCC comes to town. But I mean, we are almost close to this level. When you look at Paris when, from a high point on certain mornings, uh, I mean, it's just unbelievable to think that children are, gro children are growing in this kind of environment in one of the richest cities on earth. It's just a pure disgrace. And of course, it's very, there, there's a huge inequality in terms of exposure from people who live very nearby, uh, very heavy uh, car traffic to people who live in much more preserved areas. And we have 
empirical data to show that to show that we have a project in France on inequality to exposure to particulate matters and it translates into uh, 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 lower achievement in terms of education, in terms of uh, social status, etc. So it's not just a, a theoretical problem. Um, five minutes, okay. Thank you, Philippe. Um, so, for example, you have work uh, in the US but elsewhere also showing how you have social ecological uh, a vicious circle, meaning environmental conditions where the pregnant mother is actually living is going to determine the health of the child and then its educational performance and then its social status. So you, here you have a sort of, of nurture of social injustice by environmental conditions. So the question is, do we want to address that and do we need to address that? And I think that we have to address that. Now, because of course, um, uh, of the of the uh, the IPCC presence at the table, I cannot uh, but say a word about the impact of so-called natural disasters that are absolutely not natural. They are there are no natural disasters. They are social ecological disasters. They are natural risk, but the disaster in terms of the social impact of the disaster, it's not natural. And we know that at least since the 1755 debate between Voltaire and Rousseau on the Lisbon earthquake, and we know that there is a perspective of Voltaire which is to say this is just fatality. This is just providence, and then Rousseau says, "No, this is just a human responsibility uh, that determines the social impact." And we are very much in the world of Rousseau, and not in the world of Voltaire. And for all those disasters, we are moving from Voltaire to Rousseau. We are moving from uncertainty to risk, and this is where we can have hope. Because if you are moving to from uncertainty to risk, then you are moving from prayer to insurance. And so that can make a huge difference in the way we can address those environmental uh, disasters. So let me show you just some illustration before I close on the relation, for example, between pollution and poverty in the city of Lille, uh, where we have uh, 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 proof that there is a connection between social disadvantage and, for example, a number of urban pollution. We also have that for the heat wave in France, uh, where we know the kind of people that uh, uh, died during this uh, heat wave. We completely forgot about that in France. We had almost 15,000 people dead. If you think, and this is certainly what I think, that the IPCC is right about uh, the higher frequency of heat wave in the next uh, three uh, to four decades, this is going to be normal uh, in, in, in uh, 35 years from now. And, and what it shows you is that we are not ready. We are not ready in terms of our collective and democratic protections against those those risks. Uh, I'm going to skip that. Uh, so basically, my point is you can build a, a sort of matrix where you can actually have uh, environmental degradation, environmental improvement, social degradation, social improvement, and you, you want to, to move from social ecological trade-off to social ecological policy or social ecological synergies. That is, trying to build social ecological policy that take into account environmental issues as well as social uh, questions. Uh, and, and this is the kind of thing that we want to, to build. So my final slide, and it's going to be my final two minutes, if I'm not... Uh, too, uh, too late. Is that okay? Okay. So, what can European trade unions do about it? The historical mission, of course, of the European trade union it was to defend employment and to build the welfare state, the social protection. That's been the case since the end of the 19th century. Uh, the new mission, I think, is to defend the welfare state, who is, which is now under attack, of course, uh, and had, has been patiently built during the 20th century and that uh, Europe wants to get rid of now, uh, at least in part. And that would be, of course, a huge mistake because the whole world is converging towards the welfare state. So I really don't understand why European Union wants to turn its back on the welfare state at this very moment. Uh, the US, China, Brazil, everyone wants the welfare state. Uh, and so we have to defend the welfare state, but we also have to build social social ecological protection. And what I mean by that is consider ecological crisis as a social risk, as the big social risk of the 21st century. So integrate that in the perimeter of the welfare state. Uh, so more specifically, we have to, or yeah, we collectively have to fight inequality that are driving ecological crises within and outside the EU. And we also have to uh, assess the real state of environmental inequality in order to be able to do something about that and to move from the welfare state to the social ecological state. Uh, this is certainly not going to be easy, but it's going to be absolutely uh, critical. And so the, the very last point I want to make is that what it means is we have invested a lot 
in the efficiency argument when it comes to sustainability, how it's going to bring economic growth, employment, etc. We need to invest more in the equity argument. Uh, next year in Paris, we certainly need a price for carbon, but we also need a, a, a debate about the value of carbon. And that means having a debate about the justice argument and not just the efficiency argument. And that's the, 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 the message from my presentation. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.